All right. So uh, we're in session 20, and uh, from here on out, we're going to tackle specific topics like fear and anxiety and depression and um, other um, shepherding and counseling issues that we all struggle with and face and that we I, I either are dealing with ourselves and uh, or helping other people deal with, cope with, overcome ultimately by the power of the spirit. And so the first one we're going to tackle for the next, for this week and next at least, is uh, fear and anxiety. And I'll use those terms interchangeably, although some people will try to like um, uh, uh, differentiate them. Uh, some will say like anxiety is a type of fear. Either way, it's for us, we could just use it interchangeably, okay? Fear and anxiety and worry um, are all words, or in, in the English translation, you'll see all those words used. Um, some of them are the same words, but translated differently, which can be annoying, but <laughs> nevertheless, we're gonna use it that way, all right? And so um, the first thing we wanna talk about as we tackle this, even before, how we're gonna break this down is we'll sort of get a landscape sort of term survey of fear and then next week we'll talk about how to actually tackle it we'll get into that a little bit but we'll start there today okay so we talk about the reality of fear in our lives the difference between sinful and sound fears like fears that are legitimate legitimate concerns uh, the origin of fear when we say most of the time when I'm talking about we're talking about sinful fear okay and the reason for it why does it happen where does it come from Right? And we need to know the fullness of this thing, the sin, in order to um, deal with it rightly. And it is a sin. And I think that's we're going to get to that at the very end. I mean, it'll be there all throughout, interlaced throughout. But we want to make that clear that anxiety, though, it often feels like something is happening to you, doesn't it? And that's why they call it a panic attack. It's not like you're attacking the panic. The panic is attacking you. It feels... Like something is happening to you, doesn't it? Physically even, right? The symptoms of uh, chest tightening or perspiration or wooziness or headaches or a sense of just like disorientation. That's, that's what fear does to us, okay? Uh, we, we wouldn't say that the body is causing that in that moment, but nevertheless, you feel helpless. You feel in that moment like something external almost is attacking you. You feel like a victim uh, and it, it's you know we want to be sympathetic but for those of you who've experienced any symptoms like that uh, it's very very difficult it can be very traumatic actually it can feel like you're dying uh, as, as people have, have stated and so we want to acknowledge the reality of that and yet at the same time we want to say we can't cop out and call it something that's happening to us okay because in the Bible <laughs> it speaks of it as sin all right, and that doesn't mean that we want to be uh, like not compassionate towards people and unloving and harsh in any way. That's with any sin, of course. Uh, but nevertheless, it's sometimes clarifying just to tell ourselves when we are anxious or, in our terms, stressed out. That's just anxiety, right? When we're feeling that, and, and you get that like sense in your stomach or in your chest or in your head, wherever. Hey, wait a minute! I'm actually sinning right now. I'm not trusting in the Lord. I'm not seeing the glory of Christ. I'm not just resting in his sovereign, sovereign grace. I'm not trusting in his wisdom. I'm not trusting in his goodness. I don't believe him right now. I think I have to take control of my life. I think I have to have that thing to make life better. Otherwise, uh, life, will, life is not going to be worth living. I'm going to be insignificant. Things are going to fall apart, whatever that idol, that thing might be. But it is a sin, okay? And it is attached to some idol, some treasure in our hearts. That's why that treasure in our heart um, uh, statement by Christ, right after it, you know what it is? It's about anxiety, <laughs> uh, not worrying about food or clothing, uh, but that God cares more about you than the birds of the field, than the, lily, the birds of the air and lilies of the field, okay? So it is a sin. Uh, number one then, so a segue from that, it is a reality in our lives. Let's just admit it and be honest about that and recognize that people do sin in this area, struggle with this, wrestle with this, all throughout our lives, in different degrees and in, uh, in different um, areas of our life. And as stages of life progress, things that you struggled with in terms of anxiety and fear as a single person, don't they get changed as you, 
the, the sin itself might not change, but like what is sort of like the aggravating situation changes. As you get married, you have fears about that. As you have children, you definitely have fears about that. And on and on it goes, okay? And so because it is such a reality in our lives, such a prevalent reality, it's no wonder that it's the, the most prevalent command in the Bible is not to be afraid. Do not fear or do not be afraid or take courage or some similar version of that, okay? The first time that God tells someone not to fear is in Genesis 15, 1, when he uh, speaks to Abram before, they, before he um, ratifies the covenant by going through the cut animals after he puts at, uh, Abram to sleep. Remember that, okay? Uh, the, another famous in, uh, instance of this command is in Joshua 8, 1. Now, the positive, take courage, is in 1, chapter 1, we're very familiar with that. And then in 8.1, as they are about to take Ai, God calls, God tells Joshua, tells the people of Israel to don't, don't be afraid. I'm with you. You're going to be fine. You're going to take the city. I'll take it for you, in fact. And then there's other verses there listed. In Isaiah 41.10, a very, fam a very famous passage, God, calls on, God tells Israel, do not fear, for I am with you. This is in the midst of massive prophecies of judgment and just very strong rebuke, right? Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And there you already see, oh wait, how do we ultimately tackle anxiety? Well, it's not by going within, and it's not by going out here in the world, it's by going up. It says, do not fear. Why? For I am with you. The presence of God with us in the spirit the fact that God is my God, that's how we're able to combat and overcome this sin. Matthew 6, 25, do not be worried about your life. Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing. The words in Matthew 6, 25 and Philippians 4, 6 are exactly the same, actually. It's the same verb, do not be worried and be anxious are the same word. The idea there is to be like uh, pulled apart into pieces, which... Is a, is a great word for dealing, uh, for describing worry or anxiety. Um, but God commands us, don't be anxious. Don't be afraid. Be courageous. Now, obviously that can be misused. But the fact that any command can be misused, abused, turned into like a cheesy, I don't mean this in a bad way, but a Hobby Lobby, like a, like a thing that you have on your <laughs> wall as you walk into the house. That's all right, because that's all true, okay? But I want to bring this up, not just to say that it's a prevalent command in reality in our lives, but the fact that he commands us not to be afraid tells us, yes, it's a sin, but it also tells us, you know what? I can actually fight this thing. I can overcome it. I'm not a helpless victim. Does that make sense? Like, there is a freedom in that. When God gives this command... Or any command, what does he also supply already? He supplies every grace through the Spirit who dwells inside of us, Christ in us, to actually obey this command. It's an amazing thing because if you think about it, especially something like worry and fear and panic, it's not something out here that you can control, isn't it? It's so inside of us to just turn off that switch seems impossible in that moment, right? Doesn't it? Like, just stop thinking about it. Something like that. Stop worrying about it. When it's something that you've been obsessing over, to tell someone, hey, don't be afraid. That's, that's true and it's helpful. We should say that. We should say that to ourselves. But it seems almost impossible, doesn't it, in that moment? And yet, as we lead up to the moments that may tend to produce fear in us, what needs to happen is we need to constantly be reminded, wait a minute, I can overcome this thing with the power of Christ in me, not alone, okay? Not with other techniques or strategies out there, but with Christ in me, because God is with me, because God is my God, he's my, he's my father. So I think ultimately this command, especially for this particular sin issue, is a liberating thing to realize I'm not a helpless victim, I, I'm not just this passive, you know, like pushover where I can't do anything and I'm just falling apart and there's fear in me, all around me, and I'm done for it. And that is so far from the truth. It may feel like that, I know. But it only feels like that. Why? Because I've trained myself to think that way, haven't I? I've trained myself to live that way, to feel that way. I have forgotten 
to fix my faith and my hope in God in that particular area of my life that's causing anxiety. And instead, I put my faith and hope in what? In myself and people or in that thing that I must have in order for me to have peace. And the funny thing, of course, is you get that thing. And how long does the peace actually last, right? It doesn't last very long. And you're back into fear mode and something else will trigger it, right? Because you haven't actually dealt. I haven't actually dealt with the root sin issue in my heart. Okay. I am still of the little faith. You know why Jesus says that over and over again? Oh, you have little faith. Don't you know who I am? And, and, and we're just back to square one because I haven't dealt with the treasure in my heart. I haven't uprooted it, right? I haven't fixed my, the issue of uh, unbelief. It's not just a matter of taking care of stuff on the outside, just having a peaceful life and remove all sorts of cares and then I'll be carefree. Actually not true because the cares are not on the outside. The cares and the worries and the fear is inside of me, okay? All right, so that's the most prevalent command, but we're thankful for that. Because, it's, and because God enables us to obey it. Letter B, we are besieged by fears all around us. I don't even know if I need to say this, but I thought it'd be good just to remind ourselves and not to cause us to be afraid because I know some of us do struggle with these things. All right? But it's true. The other reason why this command is so prevalent is because fears are everywhere. Fear producing realities surround us. So for, for example, the fears that are related to just survival, life, shelter, food, and drink, right? Um, in Hebrews 2.15, it's a fascinating little verse there. It's almost thrown in as like a parenthesis, but it um, talks about Satan who has the power of death. The, the devil has the power of death. 2.14, Hebrews 2.14 ends with that. And then Hebrews 2.15 talks about how Christ came to liberate us who were, what, enslaved through the fear, uh, it says, through the fear of death, were subject to slavery all their lives. And so Satan had held us captive to the fear of death, to the fear of the unknown and the great beyond. Ultimately, the fear of the judgment of God, the, the fact that we know we fall short of the perfection and the standard of God. And so because people are so afraid of death, what will they do? They'll do anything to avoid it, not think about it, or try to... Um, push it off as far as possible or think delusionally that that somehow will, it won't happen to them. Like they'll somehow bypass it into immortality or something, right? And, 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 and uh, that is slavery. That is a form of captivity of the mind, okay? Um, fears of survival. Number two, fears of suffering. So just general suffering, sickness, or even persecution. Um, you, you see a sickness there in Luke 8.50 with the, the woman who's been hemorrhaging for over a decade who's, who comes to Christ, remember, and just touches him. Uh, Luke 18.9, the, the fear of persecution. Paul is in Corinth and God speaks to him um, in a vision and tells him, you know, don't be afraid. We got, I have people here in this city who are mine. You just need to go out there and preach the gospel. Uh, 1 Peter 3.14 also talks about the fear of persecution. Don't fear their intimidation, it, uh, it says there. Psalm 23, 4, the most famous, probably number one or 1B passage in the Bible. But there, right in the middle of it, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, there's death again, I fear no evil. There, the idea isn't so much like moral evil. I mean, it could include that, but it's just disaster. The word is, uh, the word is used primarily for like calamities. I'm not going to fear anything terrible that happens to me, even the worst thing, death, for you are with me. There it is again, just like in Isaiah 41.10. How do you go through the valley of the shadow of death, the valley of calamity, disaster, life falling apart? You go through it remembering, hey, I'm not alone in this. God is with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. He is my shepherd. I shall not want. I don't have anything that I lack, even though... Maybe from the outside looking in, even though maybe tangibly or physically, there is lack, but spiritually there's no lack. So emotionally there's no lack. Psychologically there's no lack, okay? Um, fears of service is another one, which I thought it was interesting, but here uh, you have Martha and Mary and her distracted devotion. The word there is you are concerned about so many things he rebukes her. 
And the word there is the same word for worry or fear or being anxious, right? She's just like in pieces trying to do all these different things and Mary is sitting there at the feet of Christ. Again, not that service is wrong, but we understand this to mean where Martha's heart wasn't in the right place, right? And then in 1 Corinthians 7, 32 to 34, that passage on singleness and marriage and divorce, um, Paul says that married people, remember he says it's like, it's more advantageous for service to Christ to be single. Uh, and then he says, because if you're married, if you're a married man, you're concerned with how to please your wife. If you're a married woman, you're concerned with how to please your, your husband and your family, right? So the word for concerned is the same word for worry. That's Martha. That's Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing. Matthew 6, 25, don't be worried about your life. So fears of service, fears of status is another one in uh, 1 Corinthians 7. I don't know if it should be 32 to 34. It's the whole chapter, most of the chapter, uh, where he talks about if you started off this way, don't be worried about trying to move out of that position or move up. If you have opportunity, what does he say? All right, take hold of it and free yourself or be married or don't be married. But there is this, you know, and if you apply that to station in life, I mean, not apply that, but think about just stages of life when you were single, when you were just getting out of college, right? Looking for a job or when you were at the lower end of the total pole and maybe you're going up and you're thinking about that even right now, it's, a, it's an anxiety inducing situation. It really is, isn't it? And that's a common one. And so the summary is this, we are weighed down by the worries of life. Luke 21 34, the burdens of life weigh us down. And as you think about these things, many of these things are legitimate concerns. Of course, the problem is the legitimate ones spiral out of control. A lot of times more easily than other fears, right? Than the fear of a bear, you know, right in front of you, which would be a legitimate one. But these, uh, but these so-called like everyday ones, everyday fears, everyday stressors, these are the ones that we have to be most on guard for because these are the ones that most easily spiral out of control because these are the ones where our treasures really lie. I mean, if you think about right, status, that's a huge one. People looking for relationships, right? Just that alone. Uh, fears of suffering, just general suffering that you might be going through some trial or especially in our day and age with illness and health, okay? So, and in certain parts of the uh, world, of course, with persecution and maybe increasingly more here in our country. So that's the reality of fear in our lives. Okay. Number two, there are sinful fears and there are sound fears or concerns or worries that need not turn into sin that are not in and of themselves sin. Like if you're concerned about your children or your wife or about the church or about work, that doesn't mean you're sinning necessarily. Okay. So I, I'll use that word fear or concern or worry, but when we talk about certain legitimate ones, it's not, that's why it's legitimate, it's not sin. Okay, so sound fears, sound worries or concerns. Um, well, these are rational ones, and I know that that, that term, you, you can, all of these have to have nuances and caveats, but rational, credible, immediate, real, fight or flight response type fears, okay? No one has a problem saying, yes, if you're in the water and you're bleeding and there's a great white there, yeah, you will probably be afraid. If you're not, that's fine too. But if you are, there's nothing wrong with that to be afraid in that moment. That's a ridiculous, stupid example, but the point is there are immediate threats. This doesn't happen all the time. I think this is just, these are not necessarily, you know, but there, there are those kind of fears, but then there's rational, everyday sensible concerns that you might have, like I said before already, about your work and about your family and about your kids and just life in general, right? Nothing wrong with that. Like it's not wrong to make plans, for example, like in James three, right? But what's, what's a plan that's wrong when you're planning without any thought to God in your mind, okay? And so that could be like, that could be planning out of anxiety. I don't think in James 3 it's necessarily talking about planning out of anxiety. It's talking about planning without any thought given to God and say, God, actually, you're in control, not me. I think the application could be to an anxious person who makes lots of plans and sets things all in place because, why? 
they have to be the master of their universe. They can't trust God with control. Uh, and I, I bet every one of us knows what that feels like to some degree, okay? So sound fears are rational. They're tempered. There's a measured <laughs> response to things, right? So if, you're, if you have a concern for your child, it's one thing to be concerned for them and care for them and plan things out for them, pray for them, right? It's another not to pray for them. It's another to freak out and you see it in your demeanor and how much you talk about that thing. That's also a telltale sign, right? Constantly talking about something. Hey, you know what? Like, notice that's all you've been talking about. And especially talking about it without reference to the Lord. It's never going there. It's just like on and on and on about worries about your children, worries about job, worries about providing for your family, which it's hard because on the surface, all those things are like, of course, you're like a dad. You should think about your family. You should think about providing for your family and your kids and their future and, you know, all those things. They're good. You should be planning. You should be thinking about them. But are you just thinking about them or are you resting your heart in Christ, which is expressed in prayer about them? Right? Is that all you're thinking about? Is that all you're talking about? Right? The, the, the response is not self-controlled. There's no sober judgment about it. And you can see it, you, could, you yourself could probably feel it, but after a while, I think what happens is when we're in this panic mode, anxious mode, we don't even think about it anymore. It's just default. You wake up and what's the first thought you have? The thing that causes you the most anxiety. And you just walk your whole day in this sort of quiet desperation. And when you, you, you need someone else to tell you, hey, you know what? That's actually not just quiet desperation. That's like you're losing self-control. There's an idol in your heart, and that's why you're anxious about it, whether it's your family or your work, for example. Okay, So um, with sound fears or concerns or worries, the internal and external symptoms, like I just mentioned, they are not hurtful to yourself or to others. And to put it enough positively, your love, joy, peace, all of those things are present as you deal with the regular, everyday concerns of life. The fruit of the Spirit are being born in your life because even though it's a legitimate concern, even though it could be a credible threat, your response is still controlled by what? By the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 5.18. You're filled with the Spirit. You're walking with Christ in the valley of the shadow of that evil, of that darkness. Now, letter B, sinful fears. Sinful fears. These are... Irrational, uh, not credible, not immediate, no sober thinking and judgment. By the way, there's so many texts on sober, be of sound mind, sober judgment. Did I put this on there? First Peter one and then First Peter four. First Peter ends with this sobriety on the, on the front end and sobriety on the back end for the purpose of prayer. Okay, irrational, spiritually irrational. Out of control, no self-mastery over emotions, no, not a measured response. Again, you'll see it, maybe even physically, uh, verbally, and the, the, the really where it starts is the, the consumption of the thought, constantly pouring over, thinking about it. First thought you have in the morning, what's the last thought you have? That's a good sign. Probably that, you know, it could change day to day. You know, the next day you have something, you're like, oh, you wake up, what do you think? You're thinking about that. Why? Because you went to bed thinking about that. Why? Because all day you were thinking about it. You get up, you're like, oh, and then you get ready and you, you, you know, go throughout your day and it's still there, right? It's just hanging right there. Like this knot in your psyche and uh, you get through that thing and, uh, or it's not, I mean, it's still there. Come back home. It's night. Or you've been home all day <laughs> and it's night. And what are you thinking about? You're still thinking about that. Through dinner, you're still thinking about that. Watching the news, you're still thinking about it. Trying to do something with your kids, you're still thinking about it. Out of control. Now, sound fears and concerns. Like I said before, our healthiest concerns most easily spiral out of control into sinful fear and anxiety. Everyone knows this. The number one thing that will just kill us in this area are not things that are like really out there and are crazy. They're the things that are nearest and dearest to our lives and to our hearts, like our family, work, church, friends, you know, the things that are just immediately in our sphere of influence, the things that we think we can control, <laughs> those are the, these are the things that we treasure the most. Those are the things that we 
have most anxiety about, right? That we worry about the most, whether it's our kids or family, for example, to use, or job, um, uh, to use the, some of the most uh, pressing ones, okay? So, you take these two things, and how do you discern one from the other? And I, I know I said this, so let me jump through this really quickly. You're consumed with thinking about it. You're, over, you're dreading it. You're finding a way to escape it. You're analyzing it relentlessly. Um, that's, that's the big one, okay? Um, you're not short-circuiting your thinking process. And so, if, if you've ever read Spiritual Depression, you know, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, he takes Psalm, in one of the sermons in that collection, he takes Psalm 42 and 43, and he talks about a remedy for dealing with, uh, like, spiritual, being spiritually downcast. I think when you're anxious, you are downcast. And he goes to Psalm 42 and 43, and he says, well, you know what? One of the biggest problems with people, with us, Christians he's talking to, is, is that we don't talk to ourselves. We just listen. He says, if we just let ourselves go, what's going to happen is that source of anxiety or depression or sorrow, it's just going to be constantly like proclaiming its truth to us. It's going to be constantly asserting itself in our minds, right? If you don't stop it, it'll just keep going and going and going. That's when we start indulging in that and dwelling on that. And so he points out, hey, you know, in those, in those two, it's a, those are twin psalms, 42 and 43 go together. He says, you know what the psalmist does, does there? He takes the soul in his hand and he addresses his own soul. Self-talk, self-counseling. And he says this, if you look at verse 5 of Psalm 42, this is the, you know, as the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for you, O God. And he gets to verse 5 and it's like, Okay, he's going through a lot of, he's in exile, he's out there in the wilderness, it's tough. Verse 5, why are you in despair, O oh my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? So it's like he stepped out of himself and he's talking to his inner man. And he says this, hope in God. Wait for God, for I shall again praise him, the help of his presence, for the help of his presence. And he talks about his soul after that to God directly in prayer. And then he ends, why are you in despair, O my soul? Verse 11, and why have you become disturbed within me? This is the refrain that cinches these two psalms together. Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him. The help of my countenance and my God. The help of my face, literally. Like God is that near. He's right here helping me intimately, personally, directly. So instead of listening to ourselves, which will then cause us to spin more and more out of control, Right? We need to talk to ourselves, he says. And by talking to ourselves, it's not just, you're just kind of like, you know, it's not some kind of form of um, new agey meditation or anything like that or some sort of like cheap strategy. What he's saying is take in hand your soul and speak truth into your life in that moment. You could say preach the gospel to yourself. Preach truths about the attributes of God, about the love of God for you, about the glories of Christ, about your salvation, about all the resources that you have in Christ, all the blessings and privileges that you enjoy in Christ. Preach those to yourself, talk to yourself, use scripture that way. So that's, anyway, that, that goes down the line next week to like helps, but that, that is the help, right? Ultimately taking to mind truth so that the constant stream of anxiety is being short circuited by that. There might be a small animal there. No, I'm just kidding. I think something's just sliding. Unless that was coming from the closet. Then that could be a small animal in there. Now we're fearful. You know, but it's locked. So it's, well, I guess it can go the other way. Or coming out down that way. Sorry. We used to have a problem with rodents here. Used to. Okay. If you're afraid, don't sin. Okay. Discerning. So that, does that make sense? By the way, first of all, just any questions... I'll cover the rest of this real quickly, but are there any questions about one and two before we go on? Anything that needs to be clarified? Okay. Yeah, you might try to avoid it. You don't want to talk about it. You never share it. This, the, your fear, the object of fear, you don't want to deal with it. Uh, you get angry. That's a, another telltale sign of any kind of um, sin in your heart, but uh, anxiety and anger going together for sure. Uh, altercations <laughs> um, because the thing that's causing anxiety is uh, is not being taken away or the thing that you believe will bring you peace and joy 
is not obtained, and so you fight. James 4, 1 to 3 clearly lays that out. And the effects of sinful fear, they're manifold. I mean, there's so many things physically, internally. I just put a list here. I, I, this, all the things that you can go through. You know, Proverbs 12, 25 says, Anxiety in a man's heart weighs it down, but a good word makes it glad. Talking about on the inside, right? So that if you're anxious and you're stressed and you're worried, it just bogs you down. You feel it. You may not even be able to describe it clearly, but you know exactly what that means, right? You know exactly what that feels like. And then that may be accompanied by knots in your stomach or migraines. That may be accompanied by a pulsing, racing heart. Or they may, that may be accompanied by a sense of just the, a loss of will, you know, loss of appetite and laziness and idleness and extreme procrastination that may be accompanied by escapist behaviors. It may be accompanied by sleeplessness or too much sleep, right? Everyone's different. It's funny, like how many of you eat, can, how many of you overeat when you're stressed? You don't have to raise your hand, but. And how many of you lose your appetite when you're that way? Like for me, I, like all of the, those things shut down. I cannot eat if I'm in that mode. But I know other people, they cannot but eat when they are in that mode. And so just everyone, but it weighs you down. It's true. If you look at Jeremiah 9, 23 to 24, I just put that in there because it's talking about Damascus and the judgment that they're going to experience. Syria is going to experience by God. And it talks about how they're, they're going to be afraid and it's going to be, they're going to be disheartened and they're not going to be able to be calmed. They're going to be helpless. They're going to flee. Panic has gripped her. Distress and pangs have taken hold of her like a woman in childbirth. And that's what fear at its worst can feel like all of those things just a sense of hopelessness you're utterly disheartened just helpless i feel like i can't do anything i can't get out of this there's no end in sight panic grips you you feel like you are going to die okay so sinful fear is a very very powerful reality in our lives it can actually have physical effects right we wouldn't say that those are the causes but those are the symptoms of what's going on inside of us Right? Okay. Roman numeral number three then. The origin of sinful fear. If you turn to Genesis 3, and I know you know this, but just to trace this all the way back to the beginning. Really, as with every sin, of course, it started there. But it's interesting how fear is right there on the surface. The incident, of course, is Adam and Eve ate what was forbidden. And because of that, it's interesting, <laughs> the very first thing or very one of the very first things that they experience after they eat their eyes are open they now know that they are naked there's shame involved they cover themselves and they don't just cover themselves before each other they try to cover themselves from god because verse 8 says that they heard god walking through the you know in the cool of the garden which is what he was doing regularly as you know they would fellowship together this time though when they heard his footsteps if you will, what did they do? They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And then look at, you know, God says, hey, where are you? Verse 10, I heard the sound, Adam says, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself, okay? So that's the, the, the incident, and letter B, the reason, when, you go, when we go back up into the first part of chapter three, the reason, Starts with this, the serpent twists God's word, doesn't he? Okay, so the serpent comes in, tempts Eve, then Adam, and he starts with, indeed, verse one, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? <clears throat> Which is a very sneaky way of putting it because God actually says, of the trees of the garden, you may eat from all of them except this one. Like God's command is actually very positive. He, accent, he accentuates the, po the, the fullness of it. Like you have all of these things. You have 999,999,999 trees you can eat from. This one you can't eat. Satan twists it the other way. Is it true you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Like he takes that one prohibition for that one tree and then, and then Eve, the woman, says to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat but from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. And there's some debate about this. Is she, um, like, is she saying what's true? 
Or is she adding a little bit? I tend to think that she is adding. God never says, don't touch it. Just don't eat from it. She makes the prohibition a little bit more stringent. Does that make sense? Okay. And uh, as this happens, of course, what's going on, the underneath is she's taking the bait. Right? Because then when you get down to four, so four and five, the devil continues. You surely will not die. He co totally um, contravenes God's word, goes against him. And he says this, this is why you will not die. Because God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You're not going to die. You're going to be like God. You're going to be glorious. You're going to be great. You're going to be as good as him. You're going to know everything just like him. You're going to be on top. Meaning, don't trust what he said. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't have it out for you. He doesn't have the, he doesn't have the best interest in mind for you. He has it actually out for you. He's actually kind of stingy. Right? The whole thing is set up that way that god cannot be trusted he's not gracious he's not generous and so eve is like hmm and so at this point you know that she has accepted the lie it's not that she's just sort of entertaining it she's already accepted that the sin has already happened but the the main thing of course is actually breaking the command directly in the heart it's already happened but then what does she do when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. And then they saw everything, they know, they saw, they're ashamed, they're afraid, they hide from God. And that's our reality now. That's in our nature, right, apart from Christ. And so some people have noted the connection to 1 John 2, um, 1 John 2, 15, is it 17? Sorry. First John 2, um, 16, excuse me, 15, 16, and 17 about do not love the world and the, the, the lusts of the world. And there he says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, she saw uh, the lust of the flesh, the fruit was a delight to her eyes. The lust of the eyes, she saw that the tree was good for food and the boastful pride of life. She considered that it was desirable to make her wise. Okay. Uh, the connection between Eve's temptation and sin there and um, 1 John 2, 16. And it's ultimately rooted in not trusting in the goodness and love of God, not trusting in his generosity, his graciousness, not, trust, not believing his word, not taking it at face value. And so their response, letter C, is shame and fear due to guilt because they violated God's command, God's law, and they hide from God because they're now naked and ashamed even though at the end of chapter two what is it they were naked and not ashamed now the opposite has happened and the glory and the beauties of creation are being decreated and devolving and darkening and they're hiding from god the very person that they are supposed to be communing with and in the openness with and having fellowship with we were created they were we were created in his image to shine his glory out into the world as his, as his ambassadors. But now that glory is diminished because the image of God in us is marred by sin and can only be restored through who? Through Christ and our salvation in him, Colossians 3.10. And so now the fallout is that we are naturally at odds with our creator. God makes us anxious. We are afraid of him in the wrong sense. We'll talk about the fear of the Lord next week. But we're just naturally at enmity with him. And we're afraid to die because we know we have to deal with him. So we don't want to deal with him. Right? We're afraid because we know we fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3. Okay? Uh, 3.23. And so this enmity with God, which is sin at its core, uh, is who we are. And that because we're unable and unwilling to submit to God's law... We know that there is something to come that's coming down and makes people afraid. It makes people not want to think about death, not want to think about their soul, not want to think about <laughs> anything like that at all. And wants to continually suppress the truth in unrighteousness so that they don't have to think about those things. So they can just live for themselves, live after the lust of the flesh and their own passions and desires and selfishness and try to stave that off as far as possible. But of course... Everybody knows deep down inside that they can't get away with that, right? Which makes you even more afraid. And so you just pile on more and more and more to stop thinking about it. The thing that causes us most fear. 
So we are just wrapped with fears. There's that fear of judgment, like I said. There's a fear of exposure, which is a big one. And those two things go together, fear of judgment and fear of exposure, because in the end, we will be completely exposed down to our motives, 1 Corinthians 4, 5. And for those who don't know Christ, there will be that kind of judgment, right? The judgment of wrath for the motives of the heart. Even the good things that were done purely selfishly and in an evil way. All the ways of a man are clean in his own sight, but the Lord weighs the motives. If you don't know the Lord, that is a terrifying reality. Terrifying reality to know that, oh, what I really think about, what I really desire, what I'm really like on the inside, that's all going to come out. And already the funny thing is, of course, God knows that <laughs> through and through, but it's all going to come out. It's going to be displayed. We're talking about for those who don't know Christ here, okay? It's all going to come out. God's going to weigh those motives. They're going to be found wanting. There's only one sentence for that, and that's eternal death in hell. And so, of course we're afraid, right? Of course people are afraid. Like, people will do anything to avoid thinking about death. We'll do anything to try to run away from God, right? We'll do the cra It'll lead to the craziest, bizarre, most twisted perversions, all in an attempt to what? Not deal with God, okay? And of course, not only is there fear of God, but because that, that kind of slavish, terrified fear, but because of that, there's a fear of one another, right? We're not right with him, and so we're not right with each other, and so we can't, we're not loving God, we're not loving one another, okay? And, and we know that as, even as believers, that when we are not in communion with God, the communion with one another is completely shot as well, right? And so fear of man, for example, fear of the threat of others, fear of just disapproval or, or, or rejection, it's a huge issue in our lives. If you think about Peter, for example, in Galatians 2, afraid of what the, the, the Jews coming from Jerusalem would think about him as a Jew eating with the Gentiles. And so uh, out of fear of them, it says, he became a hypocrite. And what did he do? He stopped eating with them. And Paul rebuked him and says, how could you who were once a, you know, was a cultural, traditional Jew, who don't do those things anymore after Acts 10, now you're saying that the Gentiles are bad, that they should be like you guys after you went through all of that, and you yourself didn't even practice it anymore? Like, how could you do that? Okay, but it's because in that moment, this was off, right? And so then this will all be off as well. And so naturally, that's the state of affairs. We're at war with God, war with one another, rooted in this deep-seated distrust, suspicion, fear of God. Not the fear of the Lord, like Proverbs 1, but a terrified, doubtful, skeptical fear, okay? All right, any questions about that before we go to the last point here? Okay, the reason for sinful fear, then, to get burrow down a little bit deeper. We've been saying this all throughout, but let's just wrap it up. It's pride and unbelief rooted in idolatry. And they're all together. Right? It's not a process necessarily. It's all just there. There's this pride in our hearts. Pride and, um, and anxiety go together. Why? Because ultimately, if we're anxious about something, we think that you know, we have the control over it, or we thought we did, that we could control it, manage it take it over. We're the, the, the captain of the ship, the master of our domain. Uh, but then look at what 1 Peter 5 says. In a passage on humility, if you look at the therefore part, it says therefore, because God is uh, opposed to the proud and gives grace to the humble, therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. And this is the clincher here. Casting all your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for you. Okay. He's concerned for you. Right? His <laughs> he is, he's anxious for our good in the best possible sense, of course. Humble yourselves is the command. Casting all your anxiety on him is how that command is carried out. Right? How do I humble myself? What do I do? Like, do I bow down? Do I, like, what do I do? And, and Peter says, look, this is a very simple way that you and I can do this. Cast your anxiety on him because he cares for you. It's just a lovely idea. And it teaches us when I have this anxiety in my heart, it's because I'm not humble. I'm being proud. I'm thinking that I, I got this. 
I'm thinking that if I think about it enough, right, I can figure it out. If I do something enough, I can get out of it. Right? That I, or that the sense that I have to carry all the burdens of life on my shoulders. I'm responsible. I'm carrying my family. I'm carrying my kids. I'm carrying my marriage. I'm carrying my work. In one sense, that's true, right, guys? That is true. You are. But the, the, the difference between that is so, the difference between that, that you're carrying it and it's legit versus I'm carrying it. It's me. Me doing all the work. Me, 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 me. I'm depending on me, relying on myself. But you realize, we realize that when we do that and things start falling apart, all this anxiety is produced in our hearts. Even if things are going relatively well, there's all this anxiety going on in our hearts. Why? Because we're responsible for all of, this thing, all of these things, but you're actually not. Yes, you are responsible in one sense. Of course, you are stewards of those things. But ultimately, you're a steward because God is the sovereign master of the estate. He owns everything, controls everything. That's the hardest thing to think about in that moment when it's a legitimate thing that you are, you know, carrying and shouldering and carrying the load of. Like your family, like your job, the very simple essentials of life. And yet, Peter tells us, if you're anxious about it, it's not because you're overworked or it's not because you're under this or that. It's because you are, I am proud. I'm proud. I think that I don't need him. Can you put it that way? I don't need him. I can do it myself. And, and that, that anxiety might not feel like that, but if you peel the layers back and you're anxious about something like your family, oh, it's because like, you think you can control your children. You think you can control the destiny of all of these things when actually you can't. Not, not even one little bit, really. Ultimately, it's all in the Lord's hands. But the great thing is, of course, he cares for you. He will exalt you at the proper time. So it's, it's just awesome that he puts all of these wonderful motives or incentives to get us to humble ourselves, right? Okay, if you think about anxiety, it's playing the prophet or playing God. Because as you're imagining what it would be like to lose that thing that you love or treasure, right? You, we play out these scenarios and hypotheticals in our mind and we say, well, if this doesn't happen, then all of this is going to fall apart. Or this could happen and that could happen. And what about this? And what about that? And you play out all of these scenarios and conditional realities and they spin out of control. But we think that we are, by thinking through these things, in control when actually we're just proudly out of control and, uh, and producing more and more anxiety inside of us. And so that's rooted with un in unbelief. That pride is you're not believing that you are nothing. Christ is everything. And that's why so many times when Jesus, uh, ha Jesus has to rebuke the disciples, oh, you of little faith. It's interesting. He doesn't say you of no faith to his disciples. He says you of little faith. And so I just put these three questions here to, to help us think through that. Like when we talk about anxiety, what are the things about God that we disbelieve, distrust? I think it's his sovereignty, it's his wisdom, and it's his love. Okay? Do I trust that God is in control and do, will do what is best for me? Or I have to do what's best for me? I have to figure out what's best for me. Number two, do I trust that God always knows what is best for me? Especially in a suffering, right? Or a trial? Something goes sideways? Oh, he got this wrong. It would have been better if that had happened. It would have been better if that option had opened up. It would have been better if. And I think that my scheming, my thoughts, my reasoning, my logic. It was so airtight. In fact, it seemed biblical and it didn't happen. God's like, well, <laughs> I don't operate according to your thinking and your timetable. Do I trust that God deeply wants and will give me what is best for me? Meaning, he'll always make me like Christ. He'll always want to produce the fruit of the Spirit in and through me, make me more like Jesus. Do I believe in his fatherly love in that? Right? Especially, again, as you go through some suffering or trial or something that is happening that's, that's uh, causing anxiety. And then letter C here, idolatry. Pride, unbelief. You get that all together. Ultimately, the thing that we're anxious about is an idol. It is an idol. It is an idol. And we're saying, God, I don't need you. I mean, you're great, you're nice and all. Thank you for Jesus, but I don't really functionally need you. I need that thing. And I gotta do whatever it takes to get that thing 
I gotta try to get enough control and manipulation in my life to get that thing. And when that thing is thwarted, so I can't get it, or I had it and it was taken from me, then I become anxious. And then Matthew 6, 21 and on, all the way through to 34 is all about that. Either I will serve this one master or serve another master. I will love one master and despise the other master. Whichever one is my heart's treasure, I will go towards. My, my heart is already there, that's my treasure. And if my treasure is messed with, then I fall apart. And so the question that we have to ask, ultimately, like when we talk about our pride in not humbling ourselves uh, under the mighty hand of God, not believing in God's sovereignty, wisdom, and love, underneath all of that, we gotta ask ourselves, wait a minute, what do I trust in and love more than God himself? Even if it means things like my family or things that are good, like ministry, things like um, my job, just even you know neutral things like security and comfort, peace, are those the things that we trust in and love more than God himself? And once we get down to that, to that level of desire, that, the, that level of belief, what do I believe that I have to have or not have in order to have peace, in order to be happy, in order to be joyful? This goes back to all the different... Um, things that uh, I said before earlier in the classes, uh, but that is the thing there. Because we can't just deal with fear on the outside and just say, well, you have this fear, it's producing anxiety in your heart. Okay, well, you just need to pray more and stop thinking about it, which is true, but we gotta understand what's the real engine that's driving all this anxiety and panic and worry in my heart? And this is where letter C comes into play, okay? Who am I serving? Who am I trusting in? Who am I treasuring? What do I believe in more than God himself? All right? Okay. So, uh, next week, where are we headed? We're going to be headed into talking about then. Okay. So, we've just explained it and examined it and uncovered what's going on in our hearts as, uh, that produces all this fear. But then what do we do? With that, and we've talked about that already to some degree. We're going to get into that more and uh, talk specifically about the fear of the Lord as a countermeasure to all these other sinful fears. And so Oswald Sanders says, "The remarkable thing about God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else." And it really just explains the world. Right? Why are people so afraid of all of these things, so stressed out, which is just another word for fear or anxiety? Because they don't have the fear of the Lord. They don't, have, they don't trust in him, know him, delight in him. God is not their controlling reality, right? And that's, that's where we're headed next week, okay? Any final thoughts, questions? We'll wrap up our time. Okay, let me pray. Father, we thank you for uh, just the wisdom of your word. Thank you for the power with which it speaks, the clarity in it. Um, as it speaks, it touches our hearts, it convicts us, it exposes and examines us because we know that we are fearful people. There are several things at one time or another that uh, brings anxiety into our, into our lives and we, we respond anxiously and with sinful fear to these things in our lives. And, we know it, we feel it, we're aware of it, Father. Often we don't confess it as sin, so forgive us. Help us to repent of our sinful fears and to turn to Christ, to embrace the forgiveness that we have in him for that anxiety, but also to turn to him for the life and the power and the strength that only you, only he can provide for us to not only just kind of cope with fear, but actually overcome it by the power of your spirit, by your grace. Lord, we know that we can really, really struggle with this, really sin in this area. And so we need so much help. We need so much grace for you uh, to just really invade our lives and help us, Lord, by your word, by your spirit, so that we can take our soul at hand and really speak truth into our hearts so that your peace that passes understanding might, might fill our hearts, Lord. Um, we just pray that you would help us guard our hearts with Christ. Help us to realize that you are in control, not us. And the thing that we need most above all is you. Lord, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.